Good afternoon and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. So now that Starship has taken flight, yes, it has a bit of a ways to go before it becomes an operational space launch system, if you'll pardon me for using that particular expression to describe it, but it's kind of what it is. But regardless, we also need to talk about what we might use it for. And interestingly enough, while I was at the Colorado Springs Space Symposium, I noticed a new release from the Airbus Corporation over in Europe, and they are advertising a new space station module. And this thing is absolutely colossal. I happened to look at some of the the specifics, the dimensions, that sort of thing, and I noticed that it's too big for the fairing of just about any rocket except Starship. As a matter of fact, I don't think it would even fit inside New Glenn's fairing, so it suggests that even Europe is beginning to think that Starship is going to be an operational system here sometime soon, and if it is, we are going to be able to deploy some amazing and absolutely mammoth things in space. I mean, you're not going to believe the size of the space station they have in mind right now. And also in Australia, a country I don't talk about a great deal because they're just not in the news a lot, but they are working on something very exciting as well. A hypersonic space plane starting out suborbital, but with a long-term objective of deploying payloads into orbit, and they have a very powerful and very famous partner now. We're going to check all of this out in just a moment. So this is what I saw at the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs, the Airbus Loop, also called a multi-purpose orbital module. Now any element of this module can become part of any post-international space station or any future infrastructure, either commercial or institutional in nature, and it has a much, much bigger size than anything that has come before it, a size that can only be accommodated in something like the fairing of Starship, or perhaps SLS, if you really wanted to spend that much money getting it into orbit. So how big is it? Well, an unprecedented 8 meters in diameter and roughly the same length. And it's also three stories in height. So absolutely huge compared to the tiny tin cans that the ISS uses. This is something that will change the very nature of living in orbit. Yeah, sure, if you put a space station inside the the fairing of Starship, you would accomplish roughly the same thing, but then you would be wasting all of the engines, the fuel tanks, and everything else in Starship. Why do that when you could deploy something like this? Now, unlike the Sierra Space inflatable modules, this is not inflatable. It's launched at its full 8 meter size. It consists of a solid outer shell and also two equipment rings which maintain its structural stability. What you're looking at right Right now is the science deck and this comes complete with a lot of the different types of equipment that you see on the International Space Station except on a vastly different scale. It has its own glove boxes, its own airlock, and also something called a centrifuge that allows astronauts to work out in an environment that simulates at least some gravity, a rotating environment shall we say, that at least reduces the impact of muscle mass loss and bone degradation that astronauts tend to experience in microgravity. It's not capable of simulating a full G of gravity, but it will have a positive impact. There's also a habitation deck, of course, designed for four astronauts to begin with, but really this could house eight pretty comfortably, at least according to Airbus. And there you have the exercise bay, by the way, which includes that centrifuge. 
Now, of course, in the future, we want astronauts to be as self-sustaining as possible, and this station design has a built-in greenhouse that runs the entire central core of the station, the very same tunnel that gives astronauts access to all three decks also contains a greenhouse designed to support them. This probably isn't going to be ambitious enough to provide all of their food needs for an entire stay, but it will help to supplement them. And it will also double as an experimental laboratory for astronauts to learn how to grow a variety of different types of crops and produce in orbit, which is going to be extremely important. It's also worth noting that this station is designed to be used in lunar orbit as well, assuming of course that you can get it out that far, but keep in mind, Starship is designed to carry its payload all the way out to the moon ultimately, and of course to Mars. And once again, I'd like to point out the lower deck, that centrifuge, which allows astronauts to work out in a rotating environment that produces at least some artificial gravity that will help stave off the impact of bone degradation and muscle mass loss. That's going to be a big deal indeed, and I really like that feature of this station. What you're looking at right now is the crew deck, and this is another view of the crew deck, but essentially what I'd like to emphasize is the fact that Airbus has decided to come out with a single module that provides almost as much habitable space as the entire International Space Station in a single deployment. And unlike the ISS, this is far more spacious, far more comfortable, and look at those bay windows looking out on the Earth. Or if this were deployed in lunar orbit, what a view you could get from there. And if you consider that Starship is going to have a very aggressive launch cadence, it's going to have to if we're going to use it to get to the moon. That means we could deploy one of these modules a week if we wanted to, building orbital cities instead of tiny confined orbital space stations. I must confess, I find it very interesting that Airbus is suddenly becoming so ambitious in their space station designs, an enormous concept like this that can only be launched by a super rocket like like Starship. But this is not the only thing that surprised me at the Space Symposium. Another country that I found to be very surprising was Australia. And instead of getting into detail on what the Australian orbital space plane is like, instead let's hear from the company's CEO. All right, guys, I have an unexpected opportunity this afternoon here at the Space Symposium in Colorado Springs. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Uh, good afternoon, all. My name's David Waterhouse. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hypersonic Launch Systems. We're an Australian company, uh, aerospace engineering, specializing in scramjets uh, and uh, hypersonic flyers. Well, so, I mean, I haven't heard much about you. Um, I mean, usually when we talk about Australia, at least a lot of my Australian viewers, they're always very sort of morose over the fact that there isn't a lot going on. But obviously, this seems to be a very big thing. Yeah, the space sector in Australia is nascent. We've been going about three years. Um, we've now got a, a first U.S. customer, uh, DIU, part of the Department of Defense. And as part of that contract, we're doing uh, three launches over the next two years. Please uh, explain your technology to me, your, your hypersonic engines, your scramjets. Yeah, so we have a scramjet engine called Spartan. It's uh, hydrogen powered, travels from Mark 5 to Mark 12, uh, fixed geometry, so that means no moving pieces. And that lends itself to modern manufacturing techniques, both 3D printing and high temperature composites. Um, so the first flyer we've got, I'm sure you can see this, it's called Dart. That vehicle is 3D printed, scramjet engine uh, inside is 3D printed as well. Uh, it's got about a kilo of hydrogen, and it's got a range of a thousand kilometers and a speed of Mark 7. Wow, oh, it's impressive. Once again, haven't heard much about it. So tell me about the applications. I understand it's suborbital because it's an air-breathing engine, right? Yeah, so scramjets basically work on a speed of Mark 5. Well, above Mark 5, they take the air from the atmosphere and compress it, and then you combine it with the fuel. We're using hydrogen. There's other technologies out there where they use kerosene. Advantage of hydrogen, burns clean, burns green, very high ISP, and that allows us to get the high speeds we're talking about. Whereas your kerosene engines, they tend to be single use um, and only have speeds of about Mark 5, Mark 6. So we're 
twice as fast and twice as green. So tell me about, um, you, there's a press release you just had about Rocket Lab. Please tell me about that. Yeah, uh, today we announced our launch partner as part of this DIU high cap program, and that's Rocket Lab. Uh, you guys know Rocket Lab, they're a great new space company, and they're going to be providing that boost for us. We need to reach Mark 5, so that first stage is a rocket boost, and they'll be working with us on that high cap program. So um, tell me about applications then. Are we talking point-to-point -point transportation at hypersonic uh, speeds or something else? Yeah, well, look, anywhere you use a jet engine, you could use a scramjet. Obviously, you have to reach that threshold of Mark V. So we've got a whole range of applications. Um, Dart is basically a test platform. So it's, a use, it's used for gathering in-flight data that in turn will be used for taking the technology of hypersonics further. So that's, that's the first application. Um, the next product we have is a product called Visor. It's a high-speed ISR platform. Takes off uh, using a rocket boost, but then lands on a normal runway. Fully reusable, made out of composites, top speed Mark 10. Wow. And then we have a Delta Velos, which is the second stage of a three-stage to orbit satellite launch platform. Uh, that vehicle is about 11 meters long and gets boosted to an altitude of 20 kilometers, then accelerates from Mark 5 to Mark 12, then turns around and comes back and back and lands at a normal runway. So uh, how does it deploy the satellite? Is like they're like a third uh, stage carried a, inside yeah, it? And there's a third stage that sits on top. Um, basically, third stage is about the same size as a typical third stage. So, but because I don't have to carry oxygen and because I've got wings for lift, the rocket equation doesn't apply. So that allows me to make a more robust, reusable second stage. If you have a look at a, a typical launch profile, you're boosted to about 100, 120 kilometers, speed of Mark 12, then your third stage kicks on. So we're just reaching Mark 12 at a lower altitude, but still the same speed. And as you all know, orbit's all about Mark 25, that magic yeah. number. Yes. So it's a different way of solving that equation. And that, that's kind of quite interesting. Be because we're a winged vehicle, I can launch in any direction and reach any orbit. So I don't have to rely on gravity turns or gimbling the engines to turn. And that means more flexible, I can use different launch windows, so that in turn means higher cadence. And really, launch is all about cadence. Right. You know, the ability to launch quickly, reliably, uh, and then turn around fast. And that's the way we're, we're looking at sustainable access to space. So, I mean, there's a lot of, of criticism, obviously, for And I, I know you wouldn't necessarily call your, your long-term objective like an SSTO, but there, is, there does tend to be a lot of criticism like that's impossible, etc. What sort of barriers do you see for, for your solution, and, and how are you going to overcome them? Well, if you have a look at the NAS program, as you know, a lot of great work done, and that pretty much... You know, for the foreseeable, I think single stage to orbit is going to be very difficult. I can see two stage to orbit. Now, we're, we're starting on a more conservative approach. We're using well established boost providers such as Rocket Lab. We've got our second stage, which is doing things a different way in a normal third stage. The next step would be horizontal takeoff. Uh, if we can get horizontal takeoff, that means we're no longer dependent on uh, booster launch infrastructure. Again, that means higher cadence, lower cost. And again, fully reusable. Yeah, um, and a huge, huge advantage, no yeah. doubt, if you can reuse everything except the tiny third stage. Well, the, we actually had discussions today with a recoverable third stage, so there we go. Even wow. That. Even and that would be awesome. You know, that's sort of the nirvana. It, look, single stage to orbit would be wonderful, but next best thing, if everything's fully reusable, even if I do it in staging, that's great. So what, do you have any anticipation of what your payload capabilities are going to be for this in the future? Well, for, for satellite launch, if, if you have a look at the rocket equation and everything else, we work best at small payloads, so about 150 kilos to SSO and yeah. less. And, that, and that's because, as you know, rockets scale well big, don't scale well small. Um, so we're really targeting that tactical non-ballistic deployment of satellites when you have a look at defense applications or rapid network refurbishment where you have individual satellites that fail, you don't want to wait to launch another 50, you know, turn around quickly, replace the satellite in 24 hours, come back down, turn around, do it again. And that, that's important because it re reduces space junk as well. At the moment what people do is they tend to put three satellites up there per orbit right. for in-orbit failures. Doesn't do you much good if you've got radiation flares, doesn't do you any good for orbital debris. So this is another way of reducing space junk by basically having a central storage of satellites. You call me up, I 
drop it wherever you want me to drop it, I come back down and then I can launch somebody else's spare as well. Wow, that sounds like a, a fascinating solution. Last question, I, you know, Australia obviously has been working for a long time to, to really get engaged in the whole space flight industry. How does this make you feel? Um, oh, it, it, it's great to finally get there. And again, my co-founder, Michael Smart, he was at NASA 10 years working in that, on that NASA program. Um, but we've really reached the point now where we're commercializing this technology. It's a global technology. It's got a global market opportunity. Again, it's a, it's a way where Australia can really make a difference. Fantastic. I really appreciate your time and all the best. Thanks. Thanks, Jordan. So as we celebrate this first successful test of Starship with SpaceX, we also need to keep in mind just what SpaceX has made possible in recent years. Not only is Starship going to be able to deploy the kinds of payloads that seemed impossible only a decade ago, but also SpaceX has inspired an entirely new environment in the world of commercial spaceflight that has led countries like Australia to dream big and look to the stars. Thank Thank you very much for watching and as always stay angry about space